I'm a student here at CSU, a PhD student uh, in the Department of Chemistry, and I have the, the privilege to work with uh, Dr. J. Ham on uh, agricultural related problems, and specifically looking at ammonia isotopes and the ability possibly to distinguish sources affecting Rocky Mountain National Park. You know, so first off, obviously we've talked about Romans a lot, and uh, this is uh, another figure from Romans, we call it Romans 2. Basically, they did a, uh, one study in 2006, this one was in 2008, 2009. And basically, it's showing the same thing. If you look at the graph here, you have uh, total deposition throughout a year-long period from no, uh, November to November. You have wet ammonium deposition, followed by wet nitrate deposition, then followed by dry deposition of ammonia gas. So kind of the big thing to take away here is that ammonia uh, composes two of the top three pathways of nitrogen entering Rocky Mountain National Park, and that wet deposition dominates still in terms of how nitrogen enters the park. So dry deposition is not as important as wet deposition. So roughly two thirds is wet depth and you still have significant uh, fractions of organic nitrogen influencing the park. So in terms of nitrogen and in terms of isotopes, I wanna kind of just give you a little background on how we're gonna talk about all the data. Um, so at any given form of nitrogen, you have some, you have two versions of the isotopes, two stable isotopes. You have nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. And they have some, ratio that we designate as their standard or their uh, natural abundance, as we call it. So typically, sometimes you see isotopes used as tracers when you label them with the rare isotope, like in soil systems to follow where nitrogen turns over. Um, in our case, we're trying to use natural abundance or the natural amount of N15 that there exists. And we're trying to watch how it uh, deviates uh, kind of in a small sense away from that. So this is what our natural abundance, we call this atmospheric N2 is our natural pool. We give that the denotation delta 15 N of zero. And so that's how we talk about isotopes is always in delta 15s. And basically what that means is that we take um, the atom percent so we can calculate the delta 15 here. And what's going to happen uh, later is we're going to see how we convert atom percents into delta 15 N. So basically we have zero, that's our standard. And anytime I say something is like negative 10, negative 20, delta 15 N or positive, we would say this has less of the rare isotope, delta uh, 15N, and this has more 15N than nitrogen in the atmosphere. And kind of a rule of thumb is you get minus 10, minus 20, plus 10, plus 20, every 10 is about a 1% change from that natural abundance. And I don't mean 1% as in there's a total 1%, but just a 1% relative change to the natural, um, the natural occurrence of N15. So in the past, there's been studies trying to use nitrogen isotopes to help fingerprint uh, ammonia uh, sources. So this is from a 1998 study looking at the Chesapeake Bay area. And they just give some values here of the literature in terms of oceanic ammonium, soil ammonium. And you can kind of see here, here's zero. So here's like our standard. Oceanic tends to be enriched or has more N N15. And then like animal excretions typically are depleted or have less, so like in the minus 10, minus 20 areas. And then you have some coal combustion sources as, as well. And so kind of why does this happen and, and, and how can we use this possibly as a tracer? Given under the chemical reactions or physical pathways that nitrogen undergoes, you can cause shifts from this zero value or, or shifts from what the, what the actual um, reagents were. So in this case, of urea deposit on like a, a soil surface, you have it convert to ammonium rather rapidly. Then you have volatilization. So all these processes can cause shifts, and typically they cause uh, shifts towards a negative end or the depleted end. And then on the other end, if you're looking at like an urban sources, you have like a fuel combustion. You have oxidation to obviously make your cargo. And then after that, you have a three-way catalytic converter that can convert actually N2 and H2 to make small amounts of ammonia. In that case, we kind of expect a large shift here because um, volatilization, there's obviously gonna be some ammonium retained on the surface. But in this situation, we want to have obviously 100% oxidation because we want to use all of our fuel. Plus the catalyst helps uh, both isotopes react relatively similar to each other. So you would expect a low shift or small shift. So these we would expect to probably be closer to zero where they start, and these we would expect to be a larger shift throughout that process. So this is where we can take advantage possibly of these small changes or large changes. So where our objectives were um, to look into, this, pro into this, uh, this project was to first designate, do the ammonia sources emit ammonia of different fingerprints or different isotopic ratios that we can use them as tracers? So that's the first question. And then after that, can we use those tracers to monitor atmospheric transport into Rocky Mountain National Park? So here's a wet deposition, you probably recognize it from uh, Dr. Ham's talk earlier this morning. That's a wet deposition collector we use in the park as part of our receptor site. And then this is our uh, Rodellos, is what we use as part of the AMON network that Dr. Ham also mentioned this morning um, as our actual samplers. 
And this is just kind of a Google Earth map of what we uh, chose our seven sites to be. And so our sites we chose were obviously based on a receptor site, Rocky Mountain National Park. Then we wanted to choose the known sources um, as well as possible uh, transport pathways. And so basically what we see here, we have a dairy cattle source uh, in the northern front range here. We have a cropland source out north of Greeley. We have a beef cattle uh, source um, near Greeley as well. And then we have a wastewater uh, treatment facility in Denver. And then we also have a, a sampler near I-25, trying to capture more of a mobile source, essentially. And then we have this foothill source. And I, I actually try to remember this source, this location, because that's what uh, the source we picked there isn't really a source. It's a transport pathway. So really interested. We get these easterly winds as how that, that sampling site will, uh, will change. And then obviously Rocky Mountain National Park. And this yellow uh, circle kind of just gives you an idea of about what 50 miles is. Um, Dr. Ham also mentioned about Greeley and then uh, Fort Morgan. Out to Fort Morgan, look at like 110 miles in terms of distance to the park. So we've put them out for two weeks and, month, and monthly uh, sampling periods for the Rodello sampling. And this is just kind of the average concentrations that we saw over two weeks. Basically, you have all the sources uh, shown here. These are the CAFO-related sources, and they go with this axis. And then you have all these sources down here that go with the left axis here. And basically, you can see that CAFO sources are just much, much, much higher on average ammonia concentrations um, than any of the non-CAFO sources. They're talking hundreds of ppb up here, where the highest one is wastewater down here, which only hits about 35 ppb over the two-week average of this study period. Um, and this is, this is useful, uh, but obviously we want to really get into the isotopes, and so I'm not going to spend too much time on here, but you can see that there is some variation uh, in some of these sampling sites. It could be related to the, the amount of cattle, temperature, among other environmental factors. And so this is um, what we have up to, up to date. We are missing a couple of samples still due to some sample mass uh, restrictions with our method. But basically what you see here is six of the sources, excluding Rocky Mountain National Park right now, and then you have the, this is all the points that we have uh, for each two-week integral um, for the isotope. So basically, if you look here, you have urban sources here on the far left in between pretty much minus 1, minus 2, up to 12. We have two of them right now. We should get more here in the next month. And then you have your foothill site, um, which uh, is right near Rocky Mountain National Park. If you remember from that map, you can see that it has some, some of the values are in minus 8, and then some of them near minus 20. And we'll talk a little bit a little later about why we think that is. And you have cropland here, typically the minus 25 on an average, wastewater down near minus 20 or minus 35, and then you have dairy cattle and beef cattle. And as you can see, that's most of these depleted, most of these sources are depleted, and then some of them also are really uh, constrained to a small area, which is actually really nice because we might be able to use that as a fingerprint. So what we actually found out up to date so far is that these three sources all are significantly different from each other. However, we can't say much about urban sources yet until we get the rest of the data set. And then um, uh, cropland, however, was not significant differently from uh, the other the two uh, CAFO operations. One of the interesting here is we, uh, we only have three of these points right now. We should get, like I said, more this month. But we think that it's interesting that it seems like it's starting to form this kind of bimodal distribution at that foothill site, which might be related to transport in terms of what sources are affecting uh, that foothill site. And so you, uh, we also obviously managed or monitored wet deposition in the park. As I mentioned, it's two thirds of the uh, nitrogen is deposited through that mode into Rocky Mountain National Park. And this is from April of 2011 all the way to October. And you saw this before, but one thing I just want to point out that basically we see uh, a rather even number, or number, even amount of deposition over the uh, April period all the way up into uh, August. So essentially you see up to uh, 10,000 micrograms of nitrogen per meter squared per week. And this is, again, weekly integrations. These are not a single event. It could be composed of up to multiple events in a single week. It could be just one storm in one week. There could just be up to 10 storms in a single week. So basically, um, this is, again, a weekly average. And one thing that's really interesting, obviously, people obviously probably can see right away, is this big, big, big event in July, which uh, we always talk about that spring typically has a big event. But uh, this, is a, this is one of the rare occurrences where we actually see a large event. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. And kind of give you an idea is what all these bar graphs are just kind of confusing. What kind of apportionment do we have to each species? Uh, in the spring, we typically still have ammonium as a dominant form of nitrogen in our wet deposition. You still see organic nitrogen becoming more important. And then in the, in the, in the summer, we have more of an equal distribution, roughly 33% across all of them. But you still see that ammonium is still the highest in terms of uh, deposition entering the park. So also, 
Obviously, we want to monitor the gases at the sources and at Rocky Mountain National Park, but we also want to look at the ammonium that's being deposited in wet deposition of the park. And what that is pretty much is here is the same deposition figure you saw before, but instead of precipitation shown now on the, on the second axis, we have the isotopic values. So typically, you see here in the spring, you see some variation. The white is our site, our Long Peaks Trailhead is where the Roman study also occurred. And then the yellow, I uh, was able to talk with Dr. Joe Barron at CSU and get a hold of some of the National Trends Network's um, samples for the same sampling period. Essentially, it's 9,000 feet at our site and about 13,000 feet at Lock Vale Watershed. And by one thing that's interesting here, you see some variation in the spring. When you hit the summer period, basically June and on, you see the isotopes don't vary much in terms of uh, like we see with sources. And also, you can also see that Lock Vale uh, closely matches, generally speaking, the same isotopic values that we saw at our site, which is quite interesting since I said their elevations are so different. So kind of disheartening when I got this data. I was kind of like, I was up late one night when I got it, and I was all excited to look at it, and then I got all the same values, which kind of was frustrating because you hoped to see possibly very large uh, variations throughout the year, maybe indicating different sources. So what we want to do is try to figure out, well, why? Why do we have some low values and the rest are all the same? So we picked these three weeks, kind of look at in particular uh, here in May, and then obviously this large event that we had in the summer. Um, if you have a large event, you obviously would think a large source of ammonium would be the one contributing to it. But why would the isotopic value be different? So kind of in summary, real quick, from the uh, stuff I've already showed, uh, we have gas phase. Basically, CAFOs um, are just dwarfing other sources in terms of average ammonia concentration, which is not surprising. Wastewater treatment was the highest among the non-CAFO sources. Uh, the typically only hits about 35 ppb. Um, give you an idea of what that means. Like this room probably is similar to 20 ppb. That's all of us being in here emitting ammonia. So that's really not that much higher than background in terms of an internal source. And then there are significant differences among some of the sources that we have uh, measured. And there may be more once we get the rest of the data set. So there is the ability possibly to trace it away from those sources. Um, and then uh, wet deposition ammonium is still the dominant form of nitrogen in the park. Organic nitrogen is becoming more and more of an interesting thing to, to look at. And that the ammonium isotopes vary in the spring, but they really didn't vary that much in the summer. They're rather consistent around the same range. So what we want to do, because isotopes typically cannot be used as a tool alone, we did the weight of evidence approach that we've heard a lot about today. We went to the high split model, which is a very common model used um, in atmospheric uh, sciences. So basically, we wanted to use this model to do back trajectories to figure out where air was coming from during those weeks. We saw deposition events either were large or we saw deposition events that were different um, from the, the standard we saw throughout the year. And the other thing, so obviously to assess mixing or aerosol formation. So basically, that foothill site I told you to try to remember, we chose that site because that's our transport site that we designated. And we did back trajectory models. So basically, we did 24 hours. Where was the air mass 24 hours before it got to our foothill site? Because that gives us the possibility that it could have moved up the mountains. It's really hard to model in the mountains because the terrain is so, so difficult. So we didn't want to try to do forward trajectories into the mountains because it wouldn't do really much good for us. But we wanted to be like, all right, how did air get to the front range to possibly influence Rocky Mountain National Park? And so this is the May 16th. And I know it's a lot right now, so I'll explain to you uh, what these all show. But basically, this is the May 16th period a very uh, typical deposition week in terms of amount, but this was the low isotopic value that we saw. So basically at the top left here, we have May 16th, and this is our foothill site. And then this is the back trajectory model 24 hours before. So every of these trajectories is every two hours. So at 12 o'clock at night, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m. And then it takes a back trajectory model 24 hours to tell me where that air was, or where the high split model says the air was those uh, previous day. So basically, you see here that May 16th, the winds were basically pulling air out of the northeast of Colorado, all the way almost to the corner of Colorado. So getting back to that 50-mile picture or 110 miles of Fort Morgan in a single day, air can easily tr transport that distance. And uh, why, why I wanted to show you all these right now is just because you can see that it has a northeasterly transport, but then we also have southerly transport, we have very localized transport, and we have, have northwesterly transport. So it's very, um, it's very variable throughout a single week. And this is pretty typical of a single week where you see some easterly transport as well as westerly transport. So what I did, I, I essentially took the periods where we experienced deposition in the park, and I circled those days or those trajectories corresponding to those hours of deposition. So basically, we had this entire week of transport. But for example, on May 18th was one day where it rained. And then also on uh, May 20th was another day where we had deposition in the park. As you can see on both these trajectories, you also have a little bit here on the May 19th, pretty much northern, uh, just northern I-25. 
So you can see that this air trajectory goes all the way back into Kansas 24 hours prior to entering the foothills site. So basically within 24 hours, we have a large amount of air being moved across eastern Colorado uh, near, near uh, the front range with possible influences on Rocky Mountain. And then here you also see the same thing, but this is into Nebraska. Um, you also have this into, into uh, Nebraska, down through Wyoming, down into Colorado. So again, two very easterly uh, uh, flows here with relatively short time periods before the depositions start coinciding. And this is something that we didn't see at any other week during the year. So we think that the actual easterly transport corresponding with deposition was the reason we saw lower values than typically. Typically, we would see deposition, but it didn't necessarily always coincide with easterly transport. So then the other week we wanted to look at was that July 11th, July 18th week. That was the really, really large deposition event that we saw in the summer, but did not have a low isotopic value. So basically, I just picked four of the periods there that are kind of interesting, didn't show really the northwesterly trends. And basically here, it's very localized flow around uh, Foothills uh, site, so it's pretty much near Fort Collins, Greeley. And then here is another one of these events where we see this large easterly flow for over 24 hours, basically, from, from, uh, from the east. This goes all the way back into Kansas as well. And then you also see you know, on the next day as well, you still have easterly flow near the border of Colorado, down into southeastern Colorado. And then the next day, it basically goes back to its localized flow. And that comes back to mountain valley breezes as well as other high pressure systems moving through the area. And again, this is the event where it was really, really high in deposition. And so we're trying to figure out why this easterly event had such high deposition as well as high organic nitrogen. And so we're trying to look at uh, possibly using high split to see if there were any forest fires in the area. And there was a forest fire occurring at this time in New Mexico. Um, and we're trying to look at high split whether or not that forest fire maybe could be transported into this area and transporting back to the, to the park. So the kind of idea that it's not just ag, because it's really, really mixed as the Romans 1 kind of showed, still, uh, still is appearing here. And the other thing here in terms of the isotopes, why we think that possibly the isotopes are, are all the same in the summer, we see this easterly flow again, but we don't see rain necessarily with it. And what happens when you have mixing on the front range, which you typically see, you get aerosol formation. And what happens, that can essentially diminish the isotopes and their fingerprints or their original fingerprints. So essentially, it's wiping out our, our ability to distinguish sources. As a kind of some summary here, again, CAFOs dwarf all other sources in terms of average ammonia concentrations, as we kind of expected. Um, ammonia is still the dominant form in Rocky Mountain National Park, so it's still going to be an area of high concern and study. Um, and then that source emissions can be unique, uh, which allows them to possibly use as the tracer. But however, on this regional scale, uh, mixing and chemical reactions can diminish those differences. And depending on how long essentially air sits before it actually is deposited and scavenged in the park or wherever it's being scavenged, Essentially, those source emissions and those fingerprints can be lost. So you're kind of at the mercy of the environment in terms of trying to do source fingerprinting. And with that, I have a lot of people to thank because I didn't do this alone. I thank my advisor, Dr. Thomas Bork, uh, Dr. Jay Hamm, and Dr. Jeffrey Collette, uh, Jr. at Atmospheric Sciences, and then uh, other graduate students that have helped me, Christina Williams, uh, Dr. Katie Beam, Dr. Doris Chen, as well as Joe Barron uh, for the samples from Lock Vale and some of the undergrads, and then um, all of our funding sponsors, otherwise I would not probably be here, so.